Now, there is no longer any condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For through Christ, the law of the Spirit, which brings life, has freed you from the law of sin and death. The law, weakened by the flesh, could not achieve this on its own. But God did what the law could not, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful humanity to be a sacrifice for sin. Through this act, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who live, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the desires of the flesh are focused on what the flesh desires. But those who live by the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh leads to death, but the mind governed by the Spirit brings life and peace. The mind dominated by the flesh is hostile to God and does not submit to his law, nor can it. Those who live according to the flesh cannot please God. But you, dear brothers and sisters, not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to him. Yet, if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells within you. Therefore, we are not obligated to live by the flesh, for if we do, we will die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit we have received does not make us slaves to live in fear again. Instead, the spirit we received has brought us into adoption as sons and daughters, through which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are indeed God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if we share in his sufferings so that we may also share in his glory. I believe that the present sufferings we endure are not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The entire creation waits eagerly, longing for the children of God to be revealed. Creation itself was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only creation but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly the full realization of our adoption the redemption of our bodies. In this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all, who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not always know what to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people according to the will of God. We also know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. What, then, shall we say in response to all this? If God is for us, who can be against us?
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who can bring any accusation against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As for you, you were once dead in your transgressions and sins, following the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, were at one time separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, 
its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror, and after looking at themselves, goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, let us remember that in Christ, we are not only justified, but glorified. He has called us to be his children, chosen, and redeemed by his grace. Though we face challenges, temptations, and trials, we stand firm in the knowledge that God is with us. Nothing can separate us from his love, not death, life, angels, demons, present circumstances, or future uncertainties. Through his Spirit, we are empowered to live lives of righteousness, peace, and hope, as we await the day when all creation will be set free from its bondage and brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In this confidence, let us walk in faith, trust in God's promises, and always seek his guidance.